Hi, and thank you for tuning in to today's video. You probably noticed over the past few weeks that I've been more and more and more shifting my YouTube channel into an art channel. I hope you don't mind this difference. I've lost hundreds of subscribers recently, uh, probably within the last like two months or so when I started posting more drawings as opposed to you know, cult exposure, gossip stuff. So I know probably a lot of people subscribe to my channel expecting to hear more dirt about the fraud who calls himself Nityananda and his little cult of brainwashed criminals. But if you're into this, if you find it, you know, kind of fun to see art get created and time lapses of paintings or, you know, real time abstract drawings, then you are in the right place. Hey, if this is your first video of mine that you're seeing, hi, my name is Sarah. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to my crazy channel that kind of changes gears more frequently than most. For me, art is about the exploration of the invisible forces that inspire us and the creation of something never before manifest in the world. Now, this isn't any huge epiphany or, or big genius revelation that I'm describing. This is something that almost all abstract artists within the last maybe two centuries have, have shared in common. The art that inspires me the most is the art that doesn't look like anything else that already exists. Uh, the art of Kandinsky. And he is a very interesting character. Uh, he was one of the first abstract expressionist painters uh, in that the paintings he makes don't look like anything else in the real world. Uh, he doesn't do landscapes, he doesn't do portraiture, he doesn't do florals or still lives. What he made, there's a nice picture of him on the back cover next to one of his huge works of art. Um, but what he made was inspired, interestingly enough, by descriptions of existential energy found in the Theosophy movement. When people asked me, why do I do abstract stuff instead of representational, especially in high school when most of my friends were drawing like their favorite Disney characters or, you know, pictures of models out of Vogue magazine, I was like fangirling over the the automatists from Montreal and over Alex Janvier and over the abstract expressionists like Mark Rothko and when my art teacher introduced me to him, Kandinsky, when people asked why, the only analogy I could think to describe it was something I had once heard Beethoven said about music which is that he didn't make the music, the music was coming through him. So when it comes to really pure abstract art, the artist is basically doing like jazz music, but through color and form and lines and, and just expressing the pureness of whatever is coming through them in a visual way. And there must be different personality types who gravitate towards different concepts or different things because, you know, I love classical music and if I had to, you know, make beadwork or, you know, paint a picture or draw something or really do anything, I would rather listen to instrumentals than vocal music because if there's vocals and lyrics, I find it's way too distracting. I can't not listen to what the words are and think about those words. Like it, it's that kind of, a, of an impulse that I get to focus on the message and the meaning and the lyrics. Similarly, if I'm looking at representational art, I have no appreciation really for the brush strokes or for the lighting and the shading and the composition. I'll get too caught up in what is being represented. You know what I mean? Maybe I've lost you. Hopefully I haven't lost you at this point. But if I'm looking at art, if I see something representational, it could be the most beautiful landscape painted by a member of the group of seven on the coast of British Columbia at, at that beautiful turn of the century time when the land was still raw. I'll look at it 
and it'll be like, wow, beautiful. Yeah, there's a coastal scene. Those rocks look really nice. Those trees look really nice. But I don't feel like the picture is drawing me in. It's not, it's not an invitation into that artist's unique space and unique inner perception. It's more just, yeah, something that the artist saw and appreciated and communicated through their work. And that's it. Whereas if I look at a Kandinsky, you know, I get drawn in by every single little detail and little element. Like, wow, there's something here that looks like a medicine wheel. I wonder if he's symbolically connected to the First Nations people and their spiritual belief system. There's these colorful checkerboard type things receding into it. I wonder what those represent to him. This big calligraphic sweeping line. I wonder what that is. Uh, there's just so much depth and richness of detail going on. For me, that's much more fascinating and intriguing. And while I might spend like 10 minutes with a landscape, I could spend an hour with a really nice abstract. The final paper I wrote for my Art History 201 class in my second year at Emily Carr, it was actually... Um, about Mark Rothko's greatest life's work, which was a chapel, and a non-denominational chapel. It wasn't like a Christian place or a specific religion that he was practicing. But he created this, this inner space uh, in like a, a public building where he erected these gigantic color field paintings that at first glance they look black, but it's black painted over a deep purple, uh, which is meant to give a person the, the sense of depth and moving into a dark cave when they look at it. And he put these up going all around this room in his, in his painting temple and theorized that what, uh, what he wanted the viewer to experience was not just the sense of person looking at painting, but to lose their sense of self within that field work of paintings and to kind of move away from their ordinary day-to-day -day identity and kind of dissolve into it. And there was a famous painter in Russia, um, well, I guess in the communist times, so in the USSR, who made a painting that was just a black color field painting, just one square canvas painted solid black and his very act of creating that painting was considered revolutionary at the time. He was killed because he didn't comply with the government's authoritarian stance on art, that art can only be propaganda, but if they're not making something with national pride and with communist pride, then it doesn't count. And the Nazis did the same thing. In fact, Nazis, used to have these like mock gallery shows where they would put up just ridiculous caricatures of abstract art and make fun of it for being meaningless and pointless and stupid. And it was banned in Nazi Germany and it was banned in the USSR because this kind of art that's non-representational was seen as such an act of rebellion against the standardized ideal that art should express the approved of political belief of the time, that those artists were like counterculture revolutionaries. And this isn't something unique to communism or, or fascism. I mean, this is something that goes back in European religious history too. If you look at some of, you know, the best known European artists, look at Leonardo da Vinci, at, in his time, the majority of art created was created under commission of the Vatican. And the only way an artist could make a living is if their work conformed to church standards and to you know what the Pope dictated art had to be. So why are some of the greatest works of art in Western history, paintings like The Last Supper, and paintings like the Resurrection of Christ? Why are some of the most iconic statues, statues of the Virgin Mary crying over the body of Jesus? It's not because those are 
the subjects that artists were most inspired by, it's that that was the only subject artists were allowed to depict visually. And so when we consider the history of visual art, it's so fascinating to consider, for example, somebody like Jackson Pollock, who made his name through splatter painting, who invented splatter painting, standing over these huge canvases, just dropping liquid paint and, and flicking it and throwing it and getting really active with it. Um, some of his paintings even have like cigarette butts and burn marks in them because he'd be smoking and painting and just madness <laughs> would take place on his, on his huge canvases. A work like that, a Jackson Pollock painting nowadays is worth millions and millions of dollars. Um, some of Mark Rothko's paintings, which people would look at and see, like any wall painter could reproduce it. Like it's just a big panel painted all one color or painted two colors. And it looks like he used sponge painting on some of it, like just, blah, just mashing the paint into it. People look at that stuff and say they could do it too. And you know what? They probably could imitate it, but they didn't create that style. They didn't bring it into existence where previously it hadn't existed. Um, that Russian painter who made that black square and lost his life because of his artistic rebellion, he was actually inspired by the spiritual concept that symbolically a black void can take a person out of their body and into an experience that is beyond physical reality. So like I was saying, when I was in, in Emily Carr in my second year, I took a printmaking class. And in that printmaking class, I reproduced a bunch of black and white drawings that I had made. Actually, it was one huge drawing. Maybe I'll pause here and show you a picture of that drawing. Yeah, so I'm, I made like 25 prints of that one huge drawing. And I had this idea, like it took me eight years to make that one piece of art. That one drawing took eight years to complete. Eight years. Um, and it's not like I was drawing hours and hours every day frantically, like I have to finish my masterpiece. It's like when I felt inspired or when I, when I, didn't really have much else to do, I would just sit and draw on it. Um, but yeah, I was inspired by this sense of overwhelming space in art and decided to do an opposite version of that and cram as many tiny little details into a space as possible. So it was the exact opposite of minimalism. You know, instead of having a color field painting where there's one giant expanse of art, it would be like um, miniatures, but on a larger scale, tons and tons and tons of little detail. Actually, one of my art teachers at Emily Carr said that I could basically start a new movement and call it abstract maximalism. And I like that. Uh, but anyway, what we were assigned to do was basically write an essay about the artist who inspires us the most and why. And the artist I chose who inspired me the most was actually Mark Rothko. And if you look at his paintings and you look at my work, they are completely different. He didn't inspire me stylistically. It's not like I wanted to take his idea and run with it by making my own version of what he did. It was his philosophy that I gravitated towards. It was his passion to create art that takes people into a spiritual experience that I really loved. And so it, in my final essay, I described, you know, it's still on my bucket list. <laughs> One day I would love to go see Mark Rothko's temple. And another place on my bucket list is Alec, Alex Gray and his wife, Alison Gray. I'm gonna show you his book if you don't already know who he is. He's one of the, the greatest living painters and probably the best known living visual artist in our day. He and his wife have also created like a spiritual art gallery, a gallery that is more geared towards bringing people into an experience of divinity 
rather than just showing nice looking or expensive artwork. Um, but yeah, in that final essay, I'll never forget, this was one of the coolest artistic synchronicities I've had in my life. I described that Mark Rothko is, in my opinion, one of the most revolutionary members of the abstract expressionist movement and what he wanted people to experience while gazing into it and moving into it. And I described this project I was doing in my printmaking class that I was taking parallel with Art History 201 and described that for the final student show, all the kids in my class had, had been given the job to kind of curate our own show in Emily Carr's main student gallery. And they all decided that after looking at everyone else's work, doing our final critique, um, too bad that critique didn't actually affect our grade because my teacher freaking hated my art, but the other students loved it. Uh, the other kids in my class actually gave me an entire wall to work with and had the idea that I should cover that wall in a grid of prints of the same picture to kind of give the effect that it's like a highly detailed color field. They knew what I was interested in. They, they kind of knew my artistic goals. Um, so I, I described in this final essay for Art History 201 that just as Mark Rothko created these huge fields of color with a goal of giving people an experience outside of their ordinary everyday identities. My goal in this highly detailed drawing style is that I would love for somebody to get so lost in all of these details that I would draw in a meditative state that I kind of made my art into a spiritual practice, art as meditation. My goal was that the same meditative space beyond this identity of Sarah Landry that I live with, I would love for the viewers of my art to also enter into that space and kind of go beyond the body or beyond the, the identifications with the physicality while looking at it. And, you know, I got an A on that paper. Um, the teacher who taught that class was one of my favorite teachers of that school. Shout out to Art Perry, like anybody who has the chance to take an art history class taught by this man. If you're in Vancouver, if you already go to Emily Carr, or if you're thinking of going there, I've, I've shit-talked Elizabeth McIntosh, who was one of my painting teachers, enough. I should also give credit where credit is due. Um, Phil Smith, one of the English teachers, gave awesome teachings. A teacher named Ken, I don't remember his last name because we always just called him Ken. He was a really cool painting teacher. I absolutely benefited from a lot of his lectures, especially one where he showed us this book called Art and Tears. And it's just a collection of short stories submitted by people who have visited various art galleries in the world and without expecting to feel emotionally moved by the work they look at, they would look at specific paintings and just dissolve in tears, just have this emotional release or emotional breakthrough. And it's it's a feeling, it, it happened to me actually when I was at uh, the Tate Modern in London, the first time I came face to face with one of Kandinsky's paintings in person. I truly wasn't expecting this to happen to me because I had never cried viewing art before. But I looked at one of Kandinsky's paintings in person and, and there was no glass between us. Like the way the Tate had this display set up was, I mean, there, there were paint stripes on the floor so you couldn't really get like, put your nose up against it. You couldn't quite get that close, but it felt like you could. Um, security would have dragged me out if I had tried to touch it. But like I was, I was up close with this painting and looking at the brush strokes in person and, and feeling the enthusiasm that this man had at a time period when it would be considered kooky or crazy or stupid or useless. But the, the way that his passion for the subject matter of transcendental spiritual 
yearning, the way he just expressed it. I could feel the energy in that painting. And it, it's not, well, maybe it is. Maybe it's the power of suggestion because I had already read his book translated into English um, on the spiritual and art. Maybe it's because I already had it planted in my mind that this is what he was going for, that, that when I looked at it, I knew what it meant. But boy, did it ever feel powerful standing in front of that physical painting of his and, and knowing that a little bit of himself was put into that work. I'm tearing up just remembering that it's a funny thing. That's why I have to get to that Rothko um, temple someday and Alex Gray's place someday. Um, but anyhow, what is art and what is not art was gonna be the theme of today's video. And I've kind of given a long-winded introduction to it, so long format videos with hardly any edits. Welcome to my, my boring little corner of YouTube here. But yeah, the, the spiritual component of abstract art and, and this, you know, musical style of expression where you feel like a tune is just being played by, you know, a celestial musician and it just happens to be coming through the musician who had no way of just thinking up or imagining these notes by themselves, at least in my mystical mind, that's how it works. That is what drives me as an artist. And a lot of the paintings and a lot of the drawings I've shown you on my videos lately have been, you know, my, my take on that theme. My take on the theme of creating pure, spontaneous works of art that don't resemble any specific thing in the material world because creation is already created, it, like what is already is. Um, I don't wanna word this in a religious way, how can I put this secularly? What the Big Bang spewed into existence through particles of stardust and gases and expansion and all this and that, it is, it's already there. Uh, so I've never felt the motivation to recreate that in the form of a painting or to depict that in the form of a drawing. Um, you know, the way I got into the Emily Carr University of Art and Design in the first place, it's not that I can't make representational art. Um, in high school, we had to take a lot of life drawing as part of our art classes. And I mean, I always had a solid 100% as my grade in art class because when I had that, that easel set up in front of me with a paper and a charcoal and a, a model set in front, I could draw it as it looked, you know? Um, I'll never forget, like the other kids in my class used to watch me drawing the models and say, wow, I can tell that it's Mike that you're drawing, or I can tell that that's a picture of, you know, whoever the model was that given day, because it would look like them. But as soon as art class ended, I would pick up my sketchbook and do more abstract stuff. And so it came as a major shock to me when I got to art school that there's like a division in the fine arts community where some people think of this as art and other people would call those drawings elaborate doodles which I find highly offensive actually, because it's not a doodle. A doodle is something that you do when you're bored in class just to pass the time. And a lot of people doodle representational stuff. A lot of people doodle flowers. A lot of people doodle, you know, the name of their crush with little hearts all around it. And a lot of people doodle stars and a lot of people doodle anime characters. Um, abstract drawings are no more and no less doodles than representational things. It depends on what your intention is when you sit down to make it. So I do have a lot of abstract doodles on loose leaf like Hillroy binder paper that I used to make in math class when I got bored and they're done in Bic pen. Um, by the way, if you're a vegan like me, I recently found out Bic pens contain lots of different animal byproducts, so boycott Bic. Um, but back then I didn't know that, even though I was already vegan at the time. 
But anyhow, yeah, I, it, it's not that some of them are doodles and some of them are serious drawings, but it's, it's the intention you sit down with when you start creating a piece. And so the drawings I make these days, like here's the latest one I made, I don't consider this to be a doodle, I consider this to be a drawing. Um, because it's, it's something that I made not out of boredom and not as a distraction from a class. And it's, it's done on high quality cold pressed watercolor paper in archival quality ink. And it follows my own personal aesthetic tenets of form and of, you know, activating the edges, which means the, the picture is not just floating in the space. Activating the edges is something that they teach you in art school to make a to make a piece look complete and to look finished. Having the the color or the ink or the form come off the page gives it a, a more substantial feeling than if it's just like I said, just centered within it. Um, so yeah, I don't consider this a doodle. And what's interesting is in my last few videos, people have been commenting, you know, as if they're the art police or, you know, the Gestapo or like the, the Nazi party saying, this is not art. <laughs> and sorry, it, they're not as bad as, of course, I don't want to make light of the most horrific things in history. So no, they're not as bad as Nazis because they're not killing people or committing genocide. But um, real talk, it's a very limited, um, controlling, opinionated, kind of antagonistic approach to art to consider that what you don't believe fits within the framework of what you think qualifies as art and anything else other than that is not real art. Like that's, that's super, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Peter Draws said it really well in one of his videos where he was looking at art throughout the ages and he, he would put up, you know, pictures of some of the most famous works of art ever created and then he would critique them, which was hilarious. Um, hilarious because of the way he approaches it. He's, he's quite a character. But anyhow, it, one of the pieces he put up was the Duchamp piece, which uh, was part of the Dada movement where you know, art was basically being mocked and expanded as art. So this French artist named Duchamp installed a urinal in an art gallery. And that caused a scandal. Like the submission was of course rejected from the exhibit, um, mocked and ridiculed, but it sparked a really interesting discussion among art critics and art enthusiasts and collectors and gallery owners and just basically like the the culture, the art scene of the time. And questioning, you know, just because he, he turned it upside down and installed it on a plinth, like put it in a gallery, does that make it art? Or is it just a big joke? Is it stupid? Is, is it art? Yes or no? And I really like the way Peter Draws described this because he said that there was a time in his life when he first saw that and thought, this is ridiculous, it's stupid, it's garbage, it's not art. But later when he thought back to it, he you know, contemplated what exactly was Duchamp's goal in installing this. His goal wasn't to make something beautiful that people would flock to and have an existential awakening because of. His goal was to shake things up and get the conversation going about what is and what isn't art. And in that sense, he was successful. Um, I still personally don't consider that to be, it's such a charged subject matter. I don't wanna get into is it art or is it not art when the whole purpose of my video is basically that I'm sick of people telling me that my art is not real art. But anyhow, I, I love the way Peter described it next when he said, it's stupid to ask whether that urinal is art or not, because art with a capital A doesn't need you to defend its integrity. Art has existed from the time of the earliest Neolithic cave paintings, and will continue to exist farther than any of us can even imagine into the future. 
and who really cares in, in the long scheme of things? You know, technically speaking, I'm gonna show you a book for a second. Uh -huh. My psychic powers are still working because I, I'm such a nerd, guys, that I'm literally reading this book in chronological order. And there's my bookmark, so I'm like 30 pages in. Um, I've done this with books about the history of jewelry and the history of beads. Like, I, if I get a new book, I like to read it from cover to cover because I, I figure whoever made this has put the effort in to include what they consider worth knowing. So far be it for me to flip through it at random and just pick what I want to learn and ignore the rest. I read the whole darn thing. Um, and hey, we're basically in social isolation with nowhere to go and nobody to see and nothing to do. So what better time to read like a thousand page art history textbook than now. But as I was talking in this video, I figure, you know, is that Duchamp urinal art? Yes or no? Well, I betcha it'll be in the art history books. And so that means that history and, you know, the the groups of art history professors and art historians have decided it's art. I paused the video to check and sure enough, there it is. Signed R. Mutt because he used an alias so as not to be blacklisted from the art community when people figure out it's his freaking pee hole, his urinal pee holes. I'm sorry, that's irreverent. That's probably, that probably means something else. But yeah, it's obviously art because there it is in the art history text. So who are we to judge what is and what isn't art? Um, and I was kind of inspired to make this video. I'm going to set my books aside. I was kind of inspired to make this video based on things I've seen on other art YouTube channels too. Like almost every YouTube artist who who makes anime style or manga style drawings or watercolors have had a video put up on their channel at some point in the history of their YouTube channel addressing commenters who say, well, this isn't real art. This is just cartooning. Um, and a lot of them have put up videos about times in their life where their art teachers have told them Manga isn't art. Anime isn't art. Make something that's real art. You know, stop it with the style that I don't approve of. And so I was thinking this must be something that collectively everyone who dives into the world of visual art creation encounters. So the way people were telling Duchamp, you can't just put a urinal up in a gallery and call it art at the time they would never know that, you know, by the year 2020, his frickin' urinal will be one of the best known works of art in modern art history, and it'll be in all the textbooks, and it'll be required learning for art history students. So it's, it's kind of like the more controversy he built up, the more his art was considered art. And similarly, I'm sure that within the next 20 years or so, manga and anime will be seen as a new art style and a new art movement because it has made its way into the mainstream pop culture awareness. You know, people asked Andy Warhol at the time, why are you painting Campbell's tomato soup cans? Or why are you doing this brightly colored cartoony flat screened version of Marilyn Monroe? That's, that's not art, that's just pop culture. Well, he created the movement of pop art. Uh, similarly, I think a lot of us who are making the effort to keep creating visual art, despite being told that's not actually art, who's to say that one day this won't be a new movement? When I was in high school, there was nobody else in my entire high school who made any kind of highly detailed drawing of any kind. And so nobody, not one, not one art teacher, not one classmate, not one, not one person at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery where I volunteered, like nobody ever looked at my art back then and said, that's a doodle or that's so common. Everybody draws like that because in our little community, 
talking about CCH school in Lethbridge, Alberta, nobody else had seen it before. I think we're living in a very interesting time culturally. Um, to quote another one of my favorite YouTubers, uh, Dakota of Earth, I watched like a seven minute video on his channel recently where he was saying, the time that we're living in now will go down in history as the most interesting, unprecedented shift in human experience, human existence. By the way, this is paraphrasing. It's not a direct quote. Like, watch Dakota's video if, if this intrigues you the way it intrigues me. But he, he was basically saying not just because of COVID-19 and, and the coronavirus pandemic, but because never before in human history have we had like these tiny little things in our in our homes through which we can access the entire history, the, the entire recorded history of humanity. Um, or at the click of a button, talk to our grandparents or our aunties and uncles, our friends in other countries, or meet random strangers online who share common interests because of groups that we've joined digitally uh, just by putting our picture and our name and typing it into this little thing and, and suddenly we have access to everything and everyone. This is unprecedented in human history. And as he was talking about that in his video, I was thinking like, damn, yeah. And, and the other thing is, um, never before in human history, up until maybe like the 1970s, maybe the 1960s or 70s, up until then, if people didn't have a good connection or an in to an art school or an academy or a university, they wouldn't have been able to just pick up a book with like, I think it's 20 or 30,000 years of art history, like from cave paintings until the latest thing. It's really crazy what information we have available to us instantaneously in this day, in this era. And so when we see something that looks too current, it's like our, our frame of reference for what is historically valued or what is art just gets completely ignored or overlooked. It's like we don't even realize what present moment bias we have. What I mean by that is that in this year of 2020, there are at least another, you know, 10 YouTubers. The only one I know of is Peter Draws, but there must, there must be others out there. Like just on, on the platform of YouTube alone, there would be like 10 other people who do highly detailed, stylistic, unique looking abstract drawings. And so because, you know, Peter Draws is probably the most famous of them with nearly a million subscribers, people would look at stuff that I've drawn that looks kind of similar to his style and say, oh, this is typical, it's common, it's been done, it's not original, it's not unique. And yet they don't understand that, that from the time when I first started making artistic decisions, like back when I was in high school and I spent all my babysitting money on art supplies and got really into it and started buying books about art and, you know, YouTube wasn't a thing yet in those days, so I had to read about it in books. Um, when I first started reading about the different influences that inspired different artists, I made a conscious decision to go in the direction of abstract. And I've mentioned this in previous videos, but I used to kind of meditate before falling asleep at night and see just beautiful swirls of color and swirls of light. And it's, it's something that would sound um, like psychedelic, but I mean, this happened since my earliest childhood before I had ever touched any drugs. And I decided that I wanted to learn how to paint that like these, these interconnected forms and swirls and lines and dots of color that I would see with my eyes closed before sleeping that I had never seen anywhere else in the world with my eyes open. And so I started painting that way. And that's what brings us to work like this, to, to stuff like the painting I did in my last video. Um, it might 
look just like a bunch of random colorful splotches on a page, but it's inspired. I, I developed that as my style of painting based on the desire to express visually something that doesn't already exist to be seen. Bringing us all the way back to the first thing I was talking about when I introduced this video last year. No, it, it was like an hour ago, but I'm sorry guys. I, I know I'm babbling. It feels like it's been a long time. But circling back to what I said at the beginning, what inspires me most about abstract art is the capacity of the artist to kind of channel through themselves onto paper or onto canvas, something never before perceived and, and not defined that doesn't have a substantiated name and purpose. And that purposelessness, it, it's not just art for art's sake because that's a whole other art movement. It's more like the, it's more like the, the spiritual component in art, this beautiful feeling that I get when I create something completely from my inner space, bringing it outwardly. And I find it kind of upsetting when people will look at that and say, well, that's not real art. Because it's not something that I just kind of grabbed some paint and grabbed some paper and like, uh, drooling and doodling. Like it, it's something I've put some conscious development into. And if you look at some of my watercolors that I made back when I was in, in high school, like I think I was 14 when I first started spending my babysitting money on paint supplies and painting. If you look at some of my earlier watercolor paintings, you can tell how my, my ability has expanded over the years. It's not like the very first time I made a painting, I knew how to, to mix my own colors. Like a lot of my early palettes are kind of blue, red, yellow, black, and white because I bought the three primaries plus black and white, but I didn't know really how to mix them yet. It's come a long way since then. And I'm proud of that development and I'm proud of that growth. And so when people say, well, your work isn't original, and I've seen that a lot in comments lately, it's kind of like, well, define originality because there's 8 billion people on the planet today. I'm sure somebody else out there has also been inspired by Kandinsky and by the spiritual theories of Mark Rothko and by the visionary goals of somebody like Alex Gray who wants to express in a painting something that he has seen in the psychedelic trip. Like that old expression says, there's nothing new under the sun. So why is my work not considered original and unique just because somebody has a bias maybe against highly ornate abstract doodling? Like, dude, okay, if, if it's not unique, show me where you've seen this before. And so it was, it was kind of based on those comments that I posted to my YouTube stories, like a, a fast, a sped up time lapse of this painting getting created. And I asked the question, is this art? Is this real art? And introduced the theme for the video I'm making now. And so let's get into that. Yeah, so like I said earlier, this is the painting. You probably recognize it from my last video if you're a regular viewer or from my stories if you saw that post where I asked the question, is this real art? I'd like to go through some of the replies to that. Um, first from LJ Finnegan, who wrote, sure is, form, dimension, closure, balance, message, series, edge, shading, etc. And he signed it Leo John Finnegan. So thank you, Leo John Finnegan. I'm such a Canadian that when I hear the name Finnegan, I think of Mr. Dressup who had Casey and Finnegan as his little mascots. But anyway, um, cool name. So yeah, thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, and especially breaking down by the formally recognized elements of art. So form refers to the, the way the space is filled in the sense that there's something that, that stands out as the main piece where it, as compared to like the background details. So the form would be like this big kind of 
detailed, colorful thing working through it. Um, dimension, in the sense that it kind of pops out, like the brighter, more intense colors come forward and then kind of in the mid-ground you have the pieces that start to get washed out as the background takes shape. Closure, balance, message. The message would be that, as I described earlier in the video, the, the pursuit of spiritual expression through visual art or, or to communicate that spiritual inner experience that comes to, to force while the art is being created and to share that with a viewer. Um, edge, where it's all taped off here series in the sense that it's not a one-off piece just randomly done. I have many paintings in a similar style and that would be the series of, of abstract watercolors. Shading, so see how there, there's dark, darker elements and the way the colors are mixed. Uh, it's not just flat, there's, there's body to it that's created through lighter tones and darker shades. So yeah, thank you, Leo Jana. I'll take that as the, the answer to my question because it's the most professionally worded in the sense that it uses the terms that I, I like to keep in mind while I'm making a piece. My second favorite answer comes from, I'm gonna have to bring my laptop closer, from Karen J who wrote, that depends, were you standing up when you painted it with a bunch of laughing face emojis? So thank you, like you obviously have seen the video where I talk about my painting teacher at Emily Carr uh, critiquing not my final piece of artwork, but my method of creation when I was sitting down in class at a desk. Geez, if they don't want you to sit, why do they put desks and chairs in their classrooms? Anyway, I was sitting down in my painting studio working on a painting when Elizabeth McIntosh, the instructor came up to me and said, stand up, you're painting like an illustrator. And, and so I went on a rant in a previous video about why are illustrators not considered equal to fine artists and why does it matter whether you sit or stand? And an illustrator commented on that video and said, hey, I am an illustrator, but I stand while doing illustrations. So I was thinking, like, would his illustration instructor say, hey, sit down, you're illustrating like a fine artist? Anyhow, awesome comment. Um, yeah, I was sitting when I painted this. So according to Elizabeth McIntosh, it's, it's probably just an illustration. Um, and not to say just an illustration and that illustrations aren't art. I think, like, we're so, uh, what's the word for it? We're so privileged in this time period, regardless of COVID-19, regardless of the economic chaos that we are experiencing. Um, those of us in, at least in, in countries where we don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to get a next meal, like there are people in the world whose primary uh, need right now is a little bit of food so that they can eat. Um, or, and there are people in the world right now who are in domestic violence, of abusive relationships where the lockdown and, and the self-isolation and the quarantine is literally deadly. I saw an article recently online that domestic violence has escalated during this pandemic. Like, those are issues that, I mean, if we're debating whether illustration is equal to fine art, or, or let me just say, like, this is a very childish, silly topic of a video that I chose during this time. This is like escapism from the real problems of the world. By nature of the fact that, that, I, that we're even able to discuss whether you should sit or stand while you paint and whether it reduces the quality of your work, like how your body was oriented while you made it, that shows the privilege that we have. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that there have been times in world history where paint was such a precious, rare resource where people had to make their own pigments. Somebody else had commented on one of my videos about this. 
referring to the Dutch masters and the movie uh, Girl with a Pearl Earring that of course is based on the story of that very famous painting Girl with a Pearl Earring and suggested I watch that to see how the pigments were produced back then and I had already seen that movie and marveled over the fact that the artist you know crushed their own lapis lazuli and mixed it into uh, a paste and, and that was where they got their blue um, as a gemstone jewelry maker I know the the cost of gemstones and minerals so like there have been times in human history where you couldn't just decide on a whim to go out and buy yourself some paints and get some paper or get some canvas and get some brushes because they just weren't available to everybody and in those times, anybody who picked up these art supplies, who, who found a way to produce their pigment and either acquired or made their own brushes, anybody who made any form of mark on paper or on canvas, it would have been automatically classified as art because there wasn't the privileged ability to differentiate between something truly worthy of being called art versus something that's just a doodle or just decorative or just ornamental. Uh, in fact, the word decorative refers to wallpaper art, like art that is made to be like in a repeat series. And, and there are artists who created wallpaper designs. William Morris, I don't think anybody would argue that he is an artist and you know, took part in a, in a great art movement at the turn of the century, Art Nouveau. Um, they didn't call it Decoration Nouveau. They didn't call it Ornamentation Nouveau. They called it what? Art Nouveau. Um, the stained glass windows that he designed, sure, stained glass is a form of craft, but when that craft is expertly done in a unique design in an original way, it's not just craft, it's art. Anyhow, yeah, I was sitting when I painted it. So sorry, Karen J. I I guess it's just illustration. Uh, somebody else whose name is in a, a, a dialect or in a script that I can't read commented, it is the real art of ornamentation and you are very good in it. Yeah, uh, thanks for like the low key burn. Um, it's not art of ornamentation because it's not ornamenting anything. It's not a tattoo. It's not painted on a wall as a mural or as a as a decal or, or as a border. Um, as you can see, it's on a piece of watercolor paper as a standalone image that isn't meant to be on gift wrap or on a greeting card or made into a carpet. It's not ornamental. Um, I think it's so silly how many people are throwing around the term ornamental as if just because they don't understand what the art represents or where it's coming from, uh, they jump to the conclusion that it's just ornamental. Dude, it doesn't have to be what you think it should be. Um, I'm just going to switch to another painting here that I made. I actually meant for it to be viewed uh, vertically, but it doesn't really fit into the picture camera frame. I made this the same day that I made the other one, just off camera, because it gets a little hard working around uh, my, my where I have my tripod set up, so I felt like just doing another really quick little painting. Like I said, the same day that I painted this baby here, I also painted this next one. Um, so yeah, the, the next comment was from a guy named Chris. Let me just click and expand that. Who wrote, can you please venture away from your doodle art that you do and try to paint flowers or something? Ah, as if I can't. What do you mean try to paint flowers? Do you think I couldn't paint flowers if I wanted to paint flowers? Who wants to paint flowers? I'm sorry. Um, I like your doodling style, but it would be cool to see you try something new and a bit out of your comfort zone. Also, where is your liquid latex? Watercolor without liquid latex is like peanut butter and jelly without bread. Oh, buddy. 
Uh, watercolor without liquid latex is like watercolor produced any time in art history prior to the last like five years. Um, for those who don't know, liquid latex is something that a lot of watercolor artists use. Um, for example, where I made this, this circular detail with some drawn elements, if I wanted the edge to be really crisp, where I went in and added the background, I could have made a line of liquid latex, which is kind of a barrier. It's kind of like putting down a peel off glue that will hold this in so that the other stuff painted around it won't seep into it. In my opinion, part of the beauty of watercolor is that it does dissipate one detail into the next detail and gets mixed and gets, you know, the, the way this was still wet when I went in and added the blue, that's why the blue kind of spreads out and expands and, and makes something new when it's combined with the red, kind of turns purplish in some places. You know, watercolor without liquid latex is like peanut butter and jelly without bread. No, dude, watercolor without paper would be like peanut butter and jelly without bread. Watercolor without liquid latex is like peanut butter and jelly without pickles. That's, that's, that, that's a fact. That's not my opinion, that's a fact. No, it's totally my opinion. Um, anyhow, I decided to make some flowers because I felt obligated to after reading Chris's comment. And yeah, I'll get, I'll get into that later in the video. I found it so boring. I, it took me about 10 minutes to crap out that little painting. And it's like, I knew going in that I wouldn't even like it because I'm not inspired by flowers. Like, you know, those, those master paintings of still lives done in the Renaissance period where somebody drapes a cloth over a table and puts a bunch of fruit on it and a bunch of flowers on it and a bunch of stuff on it. And then they paint that. Um, at the time, before pho photography was possible, you know, reproducing those images of, of still lives that were highly detailed, filled with stuff, was a show of wealth and a show of affluence. Like, people would paint the, the fruit baskets and the cornucopias and all the flowers to show, like, the, the luscious, wealthy abundance of what they had at the time that that could that must have been great it was great it's in the art history texts but my dude flowers don't inspire me for like oh they inspire me let me let me put that differently when I'm going for a walk outside and I see a lush garden and the flowers are just in full bloom and fragrant and gorgeous I love the sensory experience of being in nature, smelling the flowers and seeing the flowers. It's stunning. And if, if I want to share that experience with somebody else, I'll take a photograph of those flowers. But painting flowers, uh, to me, that's decorative and that's ornamental. Like something like this isn't decorative and ornamental. It is, uh, it's a mess of paint that would never have been oriented in this form by nature that only only an artist can produce something like this because it's 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 not representational of anything else here's another one of my little pieces i i made an instagram post with this recently i painted this about a year ago and i commented that at the time when i painted it um i felt like this area was kind of a mistake because it's different from the rest of the piece stylistically. And then when I looked at it like a year later, I saw something like a sunset in that piece that you, you have to kind of orient the paper differently to see it. And another thing I love about abstract art is that when you turn the piece around, there's no, there's no necessary top, side and bottom of the piece like however you want to hold it that's how it should be so I tilted it kind of on on an angle and I saw what looked like a sunset under this archway and as soon as I posted that on Instagram one of the first comments said that the was from somebody who said they saw like a meditating Buddha-like figure kind of floating on top of the water 
And I mean, I totally see that too. Like, yeah, there, there's the head, there's the body, the arms are crossed on the lap, the legs are folded kind of in the lotus position. Like, whoa, yeah, that's there. And I didn't even realize it was there. And like these kind of, kind of walls and it, there's like clouds in the sky and there's ripples on the water surface. There's even a reflection of, of the head down below. All of it completely unintentional. Like it just came out that way when the paint dried. That's something that could never occur in a painting of a flower. Because you paint a flower and what is it? It's a flower. There, there's no special meaning to it that, that differs for everyone who sees it. And of course, like, okay, I don't want to look at the comments and see, well, if I see a daisy, I think of this wonderful day in the summer when I collected daisies in the basket of my bicycle on a ride through the country with my sister. Like, for sure, when people see flowers, they will associate those flowers with their own life experience and their own memories. And in that sense, each painting of a flower has a different meaning to each person who sees it. But never in the same way as looking at abstract details will give something different to each person who sees it. And somebody else commented on that post and said they saw a cool cat-like cartoony figure on the edge here, referring to this thing here. And after they commented that, I saw it. It's like a multi-legged, maybe it's got little, little babies on its back, like, I don't know. Whatever the case, I see the two ears, I see the, the closed eye, I see the little mouth. Like, yeah, I, I see what that person was referring to. Um, to me, that kind of piece is not ornamental. I would never put it on a greeting card. I would never make it into wallpaper. This one, too, that I started and never really finished. I was going to fill in the whole page, but when I got to this point, I kind of liked the juxtaposition of you know, the, the colored in area versus the lines that were still left bare. So I kept it like this. Um, it's not ornamental work because it's not meant to ornament anything. It's meant to be what it is, you know, abstract details on paper. Anyhow, the last comment that was on this little video of mine was from AJ who said the answer is yes and no, LOL, e.g. it's more a form of fancy doodling and artistic expression for therapy. Therapy, my dude, this was not, uh, in that sense of art, more like decorative art and familiar folk art. Familiar folk art, okay, flowers are familiar folk art. You, you see various cultures around the world, like, uh, uh, when I was in, the airport in Copenhagen. I remember, like if, if I think of folk art, I think for whatever reason of Dutch art, uh, Dutch folk art, not the Dutch masters. But I, I think of like wooden clogs with flowers painted on them. Like that's folk art. Um, you know, cutesy looking little boys and girls dancing through a field around a maypole. Like that's folk art. This is not folk art. And what do you mean? familiar folk art. Where have you seen something like this in folk art? Like, I challenge you, um, tag me in it, upload it on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook and say, here's the folk art uh, that is so familiar, that looks just like your painting. Blow my mind. Like, show me this alleged familiar folk art. Um, goes on to say, but it's not what I regard as professional art. E.g. that being original and competitive collectible art. Oh, buddy. If he only knew how many pieces I sold at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery, at the various auctions. Um, anyway, it's very well done and colorfully effective as decorative art, but that's about all. So I know this guy is not going to become my patron. I, I'm, I'm not going to try to sell any paintings to AJ. Uh, but it's just not original enough to be true modern art. Oh, I'm going to go cry in my bathroom for a bit and come back and finish this video. Um, he goes on to say, sorry to be the judgmental truther here, but someone has to be honest. Besides that, I think it's a great idea and I don't see what the issue is. I liked his comment just because this is exactly the kind of judgmental, closed-minded criticism that 
that I kind of read as an undertone in some people's comments on my previous videos that I wanted to address. And here it is all summed up in one comment. So I like that comment, not because I like it, but because this is what I mean. This is what I mean when I say um, people kind of have their preconceived notion of, uh, like, uh, what, what do you consider to be um, real, true, modern art? Would it be a Jackson Pollock piece? Well, what do you think? art snobs were telling Jackson Pollock when he first started his splatter paintings. Um, it is a Jasper Johns kind of burnt out looking American flag, real modern art. Well, what were people telling him when he first created that work? Is it Mark Rothko's color field paintings? Um, even Mark Rothko, in his own unique genius, he was not the only one making color field paintings at the time when he launched his career. So it, it, I don't see how uniqueness and originality should be the yardstick by which real art should be defined or else nobody would be a real artist because everyone, um, and by everyone, I mean everyone who has attended art school, Everyone at some point has done a life drawing. Everyone has done a one-point perspective and two-point perspective interior architecture diagram. Um, everyone has painted some flowers. It, it's, not, it's not like you can judge what is art and what isn't art based on your idea. Um, there was a really cool quote that I heard somewhere, and I'm, I'm really sorry. I usually only like to give a quote if I can give the name of the person who first said it or first wrote it. Um, I'll bring this up again in a future video because I'm pretty sure I read this in Alex Gray's book that I showed you earlier, the, the Mission of Art. But somebody had said, if you want gallery representation, you have to build the gallery. Like, don't wait for a curator to discover you and offer you an exhibit create your own gallery and show your art because basically you have to have the balls to put it out there yourself and to speak for it because people who own galleries and people who publish like border crossings magazine they're not looking to launch somebody's career as a as a gesture as a gift you know as, as a as a kindness that they're doing to a stranger they're looking to make money, they're looking to sell magazines, or they're looking to, you know, draw a crowd, if it's a physical gallery, maybe not during the COVID-19 pandemic, but during ordinary times, they're looking to draw a crowd and get noticed. If you're an emerging artist, and you've got people shitting on your work, saying it's just ornamental, it's just decorative, it's not original, it's blah, it's been done, why don't you move past that and do some flowers? You could, you could do two things. You could start making, you know, the, the tried and true, but maybe to you boring art that other people are asking for, or you can go full on like badass bitch and just keep doing what you want to do because you want to do it. And I promise you there will be people who love the art that you make. There will, be pe there will be people who criticize it and who don't like it. And please don't get me wrong. I, I don't mean by this video to say that representational art or anime you know, or fantasy art, I don't mean to say that that's not art or that that's lesser than something like this. Um, far be it for me to judge. Like I, it, it takes talent, it takes skill for sure. It has its own group of fans. Like, look at somebody like Proko, who even uses digital art. There, there was a big debate in the art online art community when the guy who came up with Inktober said something like, "The purpose of Inktober is to use pen and ink physically um, to hone your craft because wh when you use pen, you can't go back and erase it. You have to keep going and make it work, and that." if you want to improve your art skills, make more and more and more. So he started this Inktober challenge where every day in October you draw an ink drawing. And a lot of digital artists took 
major offense to that and said, you know, buddy who made Inktober, like he, he's saying that digital art isn't real art and blah, 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 which he didn't really say. He actually just said the spirit of Inktober is pen and ink. Anyhow, where I'm going with this is that I'm not saying that abstract art is the only true art and that other art is lesser. I'm saying that in an era when we can take photographs with cameras and not only just take photographs with cameras, but also apply filters to those photographs. And with those filters, you can turn your selfie into an anime character or a Renaissance painting. Like you can apply a filter to it and make it look like any form of art that has ever been done representationally, but there's no filter that can turn a photograph into something like this. And that's why I personally prefer doing art like this. Um, those of you who have seen my previous videos might recognize this as the one and only painting of mine that is hanging in the National Gallery of Canada's permanent collection in the form of a print within a really cool um, diorama created by an artist named David Hoffus who very graciously invited me to include a print of this painting in one of his installation pieces that sold to the National Gallery of Canada. Um, anyhow, I, it, this is one of my early paintings that I made when I was still a grade 12 student. And on the back of this, I've got another painting that's done. I, I wanted to see how many different shades of blue I could include by just using my, my flat blue plus black and white. So all of these colors are from the same tube of blue, just with various levels of black or white mixed into it. Um, anyhow, back then, I, I did most of my drawings just in blue ink, um, or I, I was still looking for my favorite pen. And I tried like the, the pens that they gave us in art class I think it's really sad. I think a lot of kids don't think they like art because when they go to class in public school, the art supplies that they have to use are really um, worn out. Like the brushes always have bristles going in the wrong direction because somebody cleans the brush and then puts it in a jar upside down, like bristle side down, so it gets all squished and bad. Um, I remember the black pens we were given when we were learning pointillism. Not pointillism in, in like the, the proper painterly sense, but pointillism in the sense of stippling with a pen, putting little dots down. We were given these felt tip art pens and they had obviously been used by the previous year's art students. And so a lot of the nibs were, were crushed so there wasn't a fine point anymore. There was just like a, a sloppy look. So I hated working with anything felt tipped because of that bad experience of trying to get to class early enough that you could pick your pen first and look for like the, the one that hasn't been crushed. Um, and unfortunately, like that, that huge drawing that I showed you earlier in the video um, that I had made prints of for my printmaking class at Emily Carr, a lot of the pens I had made the original drawing out of were not light fast and they weren't archival quality ink. And what light fast means is uh, in, in paint or in pen, if you want to make a piece of art that's going to last, you need to use archival quality ink because other ink, if it's not archival, if it's meant for a disposable thing, uh, like say you're, you're writing your appointments down on a calendar, once that appointment passes, it doesn't matter if that ink fades into nothingness because you don't need it anymore. Um, so standard inks are not archival in that, you know, 50 years from now, they will have faded. Uh, light fast means that the ink is not affected by direct sunlight. Anyhow, a lot of the pens I had used on that drawing because I didn't know any better, I was still learning this stuff. They were not archival and they were not light fast. So kind of, as I was finishing the drawing, pieces I had worked on the year prior were turning brown and turning sepia tone and fading. And 
it, it was kind of heartbreaking for me because the piece was still a work in progress and yet it was already decaying. So learn from my mistakes. Like if, if you wanna make a big large scale abstract drawing or if you wanna make any kind of abstract drawing and you want it to last, use light fast archival ink. Um, some people have commented on my drawing videos that they've noticed I use Uniball. So here, here's the standard pen that I use. Um, see how it says waterproof, fade proof? That's why I'm able to make a drawing using Uniball pen, like this drawing here. And after, afterwards, once the ink is dry, I can go in with a wet medium like watercolor paint that's been heavily watered down and paint over these lines and they don't spread or smear. Um, so by using a waterproof ink, I'm able to make a drawing that I can later turn into a watercolor painting. Um, and by using something that is archival and fade proof, it means that it's going to stand the test of time. Towards the end of that giant drawing, I started using Uniball. And that's why like a lot of it is still sharp, crisp black. I, I actually gave that drawing to a friend of mine in Vancouver but I prefer the lithograph print to the original. And the reason I prefer the lithograph print is that when I, when I reproduced the drawing in the form of a print, all the places where the ink had faded and started to kind of yellow, all of that was returned back to the pristine black. So it actually looks better as a print than the original drawing, which wouldn't be the case if I used something like this. And I, I wanted to say, like, the, the reason I made that big giant drawing was that uh, in the 12th grade, my graduation, um, I, I was never really the top student in my school. Like, I, I, I had good, I had amazingly good grades in English, social studies, and art, um, but math and science were never that good, and French language arts, my French language arts grade was almost as bad as my math grade because holy crap there's a lot of um there's a lot of confusing silent letters and cases and in English we have past present and future but in French they have like I think at least 25 different tenses there's like complicated past complicated present complicated future simple past masculine past and feminine past like they're there, it's crazy. There, there was a whole shelf of books just for conjugating verbs, and I never got the hang of it. So where I'm going with that, um, I was never really academically acclaimed in high school because French language arts and math and science were, were always a little difficult for me. But the, the one class where I always excelled was art class. And so at the end of grade 12, I, I actually won an award for having the highest art grade in my school. Uh, in fact, my art teacher, I, I'm going to brag a little here because sometimes we have to remember the things that are good about ourselves, especially when we get tons of harsh criticism in our comment section on social media. Um, but my art teacher actually told me that in, in her, I think at that time it was 25 years of teaching, she had never given a student 100% as their final grade in art before I was the first. And I was so grateful to her for that. She's the one who encouraged me to go to Emily Carr. And I, I won an award in high school that like during the end of the year award ceremony, I got the, the honors and art award. And it included a tour of the University of Lethbridge art department and I didn't go to the University of Lethbridge because I really wanted to move to a big city and go to a, a highly acclaimed art school like Emily Carr. Um, in retrospect, I think the U of L would have been just as good as Emily Carr for the fine arts department, especially like the tour they gave the studio spaces were way better than what Emily Carr students got for a lower price. But anyway, um, it was a cool tour because the the school, the art department has quite a collection of prints and paintings and drawings and 
you know, being there with the archivist, I, I got to see like original Picasso drawings that, I mean, that's, that's cubism. It's not abstract expressionism, but it's definitely interrelated to the, the styles of art that made it possible for pure abstract expressionism to emerge and, and to be, you know, to stand alone as, a, as an art movement. Anyway, another part of that award was getting a $100 gift certificate to the local art supply shop. And I decided that, you know, after years of buying cheap art supplies and just making do with what I could afford, I decided to buy the biggest, most expensive piece of paper I could find and the best pens that they had available. Note to past self, what they call the best pens are not archival or waterproof or fade proof, so maybe ask next time for that. But anyway, I, I bought that giant piece of paper. I think it was 24 by 36 inches. I'd have to measure it to be exact, but it was the biggest piece of paper that they had and it was kind of like a gift to myself to, to make one of my drawings on the largest possible scale. Anyway, there, there was another story I started earlier in this video that I didn't finish that I kind of wanted to wrap up where I had said that uh, my Art History 201 project um, essay was describing Mark Rothko and his influence on my work. And I described that th the same way his goal for his color field paintings was to take people into an experience out of body, like a transcendental state through art that my ultimate goal as an artist was to do that through my abstract detailed drawings and it was a lofty goal to set like that that's something that if ever it happens it would be the the, the grandest possible experience and i i was really um i was really excited to discover like at the end of that exhibit when it was all wrapped up when we took our prints down and cleared the gallery space. I had uh, at least 25 prints of that drawing. I gave one of them as a gift to a lady named Christine, who was the manager of a shop on Granville Island called the Crystal Ark. And that place was like my sanctuary. Um, whenever I had time between classes at Emily Carr, or if I got to Granville Island early, um, or, or if classes finished, early and I, I had some time before the shops closed, I would always go into the crystal arc to kind of decompress and just hold some gemstones and try on some jewelry. And I was on an art student budget, so I couldn't afford to buy much. But, you know, once in a while I would treat myself to a little piece of gemstone jewelry because it, it felt talismanic. When I looked at those stones, even if I was in a stressful class or, um, when I, when I had a, an annoying customer at work, I was working a retail job at the time, fashion retail. I, I could look at those gemstones and remember that there's something more to my life than just that stress. And Christine really took a lot of time. She, she was one of the coolest people I know because Sometimes she would spend two hours with me talking about her favorite stones and how she uses them and which meditations she does. And she was just one of those really cool, inspiring people who I've met in life who um, I probably don't give her enough credit in my videos when I talk about my inspiration behind gemstone jewelry and stuff because it just doesn't come up. But I, I really want to say she was one of those people who I met who changed my life for the better. So anyway, I, I brought her a print of that, that lithograph, a, a, a lithograph print of that huge drawing. And when I gave it to her, she looked at it for the longest time and then said, you go to Emily Carr, did you exhibit this in the main gallery where you took up like an entire wall? And, and that whole wall was covered in prints of this? And, like, I already kind of thought Christine was, like, a crazy, psychic, good witch. Like, I, I she, was a, she was that earth mama type who wore, like, organic clothes and earth tones and tons of crystals. And she had, like, long natural hair. Like, I already thought she's probably a psychic. 
But when she asked me that, it was like, okay, this is something else entirely. And, and I, I said, yes, like, yeah, this was exhibited in the student gallery, taking up an entire wall. Like, how did you know that? And I thought she was going to tell me, like, I have an impression and I feel it in the air and I could just see it up on the wall. But no, uh, she said that a friend of hers had been on Granville Island to visit her like a week before. And that while he was wandering around on Granville Island, he saw that there was a student show at Emily Carr. And the way Christine described it, like I, I could totally understand what she was saying. She said that he told her he almost didn't go in because any time he had looked at the student work in that gallery, it was always just kind of disturbing. Like a girl made a piece with her dirty panties and somebody else had, had made a performance piece where like it, it was just um, yelling at people, like racial slurs to prove a point, allegedly. Um, and, and he just didn't like that vibe, like it was bad energy. But that particular day, he decided to go into the exhibiting space anyway and have a look at what was there. And she said that he told her she had to go in and look at the piece on the back wall because he told her that at first glance, it just looked like a bunch of really busy abstract drawings. But when he stopped and looked at it, he suddenly felt this wave of spiritual positive energy wave like engulf him. And as he was studying the details, he felt so overwhelmed by, by the entire large piece with tiny spots that it took him into what he described as an out-of-body experience. He, he felt completely uplifted beyond the daily name, profession, identity into, into a higher kind of collective consciousness space. And like as she was telling me this, she was amazed because she said that she had, had kind of made a note to self that if she got some time, she would go check out that exhibit. And when she finally tried to, like that day or the day before, it had already been taken down. So she really regretted missing it. But I mean, people who managed shops on Granville Island, it's not like they had tons of time to just go wander around on Granville Island and, and check stuff out because it, it's a very touristy little place. So you might not get a break in your, in your work day working retail there. Um, so she was amazed that I brought in a piece and gifted it to her because then even though she didn't get to see the exhibit, she still got to, to hold that art and experience it. And what's so cool is that she said when, when this friend of hers told her about this out-of-body experience he had looking at the art, she never in a million years would have imagined that she was friends with that artist, that that artist was one of her customers at work. And when I decided to give her that piece, of course, I had no idea that a friend of hers had literally experienced in that piece what my goal was when I created the work. And so I told Christine, like, my mind was blown and, and that she had to thank her friend for me because that was the best, like, there's no negative comment on my YouTube channel there's no judgment, there's no criticism anybody can ever give me as an artist that will take away the fact that I already in that moment felt the fulfillment of my artistic goal. It, it doesn't matter whether or not my name ever enters a history book. It doesn't matter whether people will remember me as an original, unique, modern artist. What matters to me is that whoever is looking to have a, a divine experience through a piece of art, that if, if my work happens to fall in their lap or appear on their computer screen or draw them into a gallery, my goal in art is that they experience the same positive vibes that I feel when I make the art. And so I told Christine, like, this was the biggest synchronicity I've ever had in my art life that if I hadn't gifted her one of those prints, I never would have heard the feedback from just a random guy on the street who walked into that exhibiting space and felt what I was hoping viewers would feel. 
I only wish I hadn't already handed in my Art History 201 paper because that would have been such a cool concluding paragraph, like, and this is what happened. But anyhow, I, I still got an A, so it doesn't really matter. But uh, yeah, that, that was the greatest synchronicity I, I had in my whole time at Emily Carr. And, and that's what drives me to keep making videos like this and, and to, not like this, this is a different kind of video, but that's what drives me to keep making videos where I draw pictures and, and tell stories because here, here, I'm almost ready to make my next coloring book. I've almost filled up this baby. But when I make videos where I do like a, a real time drawing and as I talk, I draw something like this. It's not my goal to be defined as a real artist by art snobs who just happen to be trolling YouTube for people to pass judgment on. Um, it's, it's my goal to inspire other creative people to create something of their own and to express that indescribable non-verbal space that we enter when we're just purely creating something when we're not reproducing in two dimensions something already existent in three dimension, but when we are coming up with something totally new and unique. Um, and I just want to say like another synchronicity happened just today as I was editing the, editing the other video clips where I'm visible on screen that I filmed yesterday. Um, getting ready to do this segment of the video where I show you guys some of my some of my art and talk about the process and the expression in it. I checked my Instagram feed and there was a lovely view. In fact, I'm going to stop right here and just show you what turned up on Instagram. Yeah, so the, the newest synchronicity is that my goal in making these drawing videos is to inspire other people to get creative. And just today, as I was getting ready to do the second uh, recording for this video, Karen Burrell, shout out to you. Um, she tagged me in an Instagram post where she shared this drawing of hers and said that she was kind of drawing along to one of my YouTube videos and wanted to share with me that finished piece. And I immediately recognized it, that, that she was drawing along to one of my recent videos where I tell some ghost stories as I make a drawing because I recognized the central form within her drawing as the, the central form within that drawing I made. And what's so cool is that she kind of ran with it and made it her own and added new elements into it that weren't in my original drawing. So it, it's not just a copy, it's a... It's a copy done in a totally different style, like in her style, um, where she's kind of played with the proportions a bit and changed them up and kind of filled the space more. Whereas in, in my piece, um, I'll show you right now, in, in my piece, the, the drawing elements are more separated. There's more space between them. So Karen has really filled in those gaps with, with drawn elements of her own. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with me because that means... Um, regardless of any criticisms or critiques about whether it real it, it is real art or not, my goal was achieved. And, and what was my goal? It, it was to share my joy in, in this art and to inspire other people to get creative and make something of their own. And ultimately, I think that is the goal every, at least every art YouTuber has, is to share their work and inspire other people to make something unique with it. So anyway, thank you so much, Karen. It, it made my day. And thank you also for giving me the go ahead to include this in the video. All right, so I hope you found this interesting. I hope I didn't seem too defensive or preachy in this one. That wasn't my goal. It's basically just to describe, this is who I am. This is why I do what I do. And yeah, like the, the person who told me that I should you know, move out of my abstract stuff into florals. Like, I, okay, so I made a little flowery painting. It took me about 10 minutes. I crapped it out because I felt like I had to. Um, you know, based on his comments, I Googled a, a YouTube video, how to paint flowers in watercolor. I watched like 30 seconds of it and I made this and I thought, you know what? 
it looks pretty crappy. And you know why it looks pretty crappy? Because I wasn't inspired by it. I was thinking like, okay, I'll paint this because somebody requested it and I feel obligated to. Um, but to me, floral art is decorative. It's ornamental. What would I use something like this for? Even if I made the best possible version of a watercolor flower bouquet, I would see that as going on maybe a Mother's Day card with like a little poem about what a mother's love means. Um, maybe like as a tag attached to a bouquet of roses with a romantic message to your partner. Like that's, that's ornamental. I would see this as either being made into a wallpaper or a greeting card. I would never, you know, blow this up into a large style print and put it on my wall. Um, to me, that's uninspired and unoriginal. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to knock the people out there who do floral art. No offense meant by this. Like, Emily Artful made a cool little video about, what did she call them? I think she called them anxiety flowers. Um, I'll have to fact check on my memory there, but she made a video about how whenever she doesn't know what else to paint and, and she's feeling anxious, she just paints a bunch of watercolor flowers because it, it feels good and they look pretty and it helps her get through that creative block. Um, and I can totally appreciate why somebody would do that. Um, I started a second tutorial and this is as far as I got when I thought, you know what? This is stupid. Why am I even doing this? Why am I forcing myself to paint something that I personally find uninspiring and boring? And that I already know going in, I'm not going to like the finished piece or, or feel that it's a representation of my creativity. Um, so the people who say that something like this is ornamental, I wouldn't put this on a Mother's Day card because what is it? It's a... It's more, it's something created to be displayed as art. It's not something created to decorate something else. Anyway, blah, blah, blah is over. I wanna give a shout out to my friend Cami, who made me these earrings that I've been wearing in this video. I think they're gorgeous. I chose these earrings specifically to wear today because the crafting community, a lot of people um, like to differentiate between fine arts and crafts. And so I was gonna get into that too. Like here's some beaded bracelets I made that I sell in my Etsy shop. There's lapis lazuli and peridot and aquamarine. And these guys, I have, I will not take offense if you say that's just beading, that's, that's not art. Yeah, definitely I don't consider these bracelets to be art. That's a craft. But these kinds of earrings, like where she's designed them and come up with a color scheme and woven them, and I love the way she's done this little fringe. I think of my friend Cami as a beading artist. And yeah, so she has her own Etsy shop where she sells jewelry like this. And so I'll put a link to her Etsy shop. Um, I also wanna show you guys something I bought a few months ago, back in December, I bought this as a birthday present to myself from an Etsy shop called Sparks by Zan. It's beaded, it's a little medicine pouch and made out of seed beads where Sparks by Zan has personally redesigned the Fool card from the tarot deck. And it's the first card of the Major Arcana and it symbolizes the Fool, which is kind of like the the explorer or the adventurer in all of us kind of stepping into life's journey not knowing what's ahead and as soon as i saw this i, I was doing a, an etsy search for medicine pouches because i just find them so cool um i bought this as a birthday present to myself because i saw how the way it was designed there's this beautiful bright blue sea and beautiful kind of happy blue sky it matches my nails that's just a happy accident but it's like all light and there's gold and bright colors that this fool is stepping into and a bunch of darkness in the background and the fool cards in, in most decks don't usually look like that 
But I liked how, to me, this symbolizes leaving a lot of dark, murky confusion behind and stepping forward into a bright future, even if you don't know what that future holds. You're moving forward into something good. And I mean, there's all kinds of philosophy behind what tarot readers call the fool's journey, which is moving through all the 78 cards of the deck into various life experiences and discoveries and lessons and stuff. But I feel like this new path I'm embarking on in life, leaving some cult BS in the past and kind of coming through the darkness of awakening to myself again, it's kind of like now I'm the fool once more. Like I'm, I'm jumping back into the unexpected journey of life. And yeah, there's probably a lot of lessons coming up and a lot of new journeys and new discovery, but the future is looking bright. Wanted to share that and just give a shout out. I'll put a link to that Etsy shop too. Yeah, and here's a cool choker. I wore this in one of my videos before, but my Auntie Mary Lynn made this. And she actually designed it herself and wove it in beads. And it is the high level bridge here in, in my hometown of Lethbridge, Alberta. And she designed this, um, you know, she made it for me when I moved to Vancouver. So I'd have like a little bit of Lethbridge to take with me. I'll just pop it on. I mean, why not? It's got a magnetic clasp, so it's easy to put on hands-free. Oh, it goes with these earrings. Oh, I should have worn this out this whole video. Anyhow, I just wanted to show that like this debate of what is art it's not just the the painting community or the people who draw who encounter this it's also people who do handicrafts and like i said i think if you're just stringing beads and tying them up it's a craft but if you're designing something and, and weaving it and focusing on color schemes and creating something totally original like these or like this or like that then i, I think there's definitely an element of art to it um and I'll put a link to my own Etsy shop too. And you know, some of the stuff I make, I would consider to be art, not just craft. Uh, like this pendant here. Yeah, so anyhow, thank you for watching this exceptionally long video. And let me know in the comments below how you feel about all of this. You know, if you're one of the people who said that my work is just ornamental and decorative and precious, then thank you because you got this conversation started. And you know, I can take criticism, I can take feedback. Um, I wouldn't have a public channel on YouTube if I couldn't. I would probably just wall myself up at home and never show anybody my drawings because they're my precious babies. Uh, no, I, I can take it. Um, but let me know in the comments below. Do you understand now a bit more where I'm coming from with this art? Has it made any difference in your opinions? Um, and again, in the comments below, who are your favorite artists? What art movements in history have inspired you? If you make art of your own, like what are your influences? I'm, I'm curious to know. Thanks for watching. Much love. Um, be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, hit the notifications bell um, so that you'll know when I upload new videos. I try to do two a week. And yeah, let just thank you for being here. And I wish you good health and safety during this pandemic. And I, I hope your family is doing well. It's, it's a tough time for all of us, especially financially, like, eek. I hope we all pull through this, but I'm, I'm sure we'll all pull through this. And meanwhile, thank you for welcoming me into your life during this very strange time of, of transformation for all of us. Much love. See you next time. Bye.